Hi, this is Mike Bloom. Thanks for checking out our sermon today. I pray that this message blesses you and gives you greater victory in your everyday walk in the kingdom of God here and now. God bless you richly. How many love to hear the word of the Lord? Amen. You know, I preached here before, and you know when people love the word or not, because I was just saying to my wife on the way up here this morning that in the Old Testament, when the prophet told the woman, as long as you have a bunch of empty, open vessels, the oil's going to keep on flowing. As soon as there's no more open vessels, the oil's going to stop. And I've been in places where the anointing oil stopped because people were shut off. But when people are open and wanted, yeah. then the anointing just flows. And I've felt the anointing here, so I know you love the Word. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But before we get into the Word, I want my daughter to come up and sing a chorus, a song this morning. And uh, it's got to do with what I want to preach about. How many want to get into the Spirit today? Yeah. You know what it is when you get in the Spirit? You're getting in the holiest of holies. Yeah. Somebody say, in the Spirit, in the spirit. means in the holiest. And so we're going to go into the Spirit today. And I think we're already there. But if you're not there yet, come along with us. Yes. Praise hey, God. Summer, that'd be awesome. <laughs> You guys all know this song. It's not new. So you can be seated if you like or if you want to stand and worship, that's fine. But, um, Thank you, Lord. We just feel so blessed to be here today. And we're just so thankful mm. for you guys. You guys have a great congregation here. We're always blessed to be here. We're always blessed to enjoy church with you like we did a couple weekends ago or whatever. God is so good to us. Our girls um, have just returned from Missouri, from Tornado Country. You want to guide them all through the tornado? down there with their, um, they attend a, a private Christian school and they have a big international convention down there that the students just attended. And so they're all fired up. <laughs> they have a lot of competitions in the daytime, but they have church at night. And um, 40 years ago when um, this school started, it was started, uh, has its roots in a denomination that doesn't believe in being filled with the Holy Ghost or speaking in tongues or any of that stuff. So it's Sometimes it's a bit of a challenge when those students get together that are more on fire for God or whatever. But over the 40 years, some of them got filled with the Holy Ghost. And so it's kind of a bit of a challenge. So now they have discovered over the years when they have their evening rallies that they have more response from the children, from the students, if they have someone who's spirit-filled. <laughs> and so some of the other ones who don't believe you should ever speak in tongues find it hard to sit and listen. <laughs> but anyways, they've been I doing some... <laughs> I love this preaching. <laughs> some of them that... Uh, some of them that didn't care for it, they kind of had to sit through it with a grim face. But anyways, our girls really enjoyed that, so they're really blessed. And if I could just make a plug for Christian schools. <laughs> you guys know how I feel that you guys need to start a school down here. I'll just put that in for Mr. McLaren. <laughs> Anyways, I didn't really feel anything on my heart this morning, but Amber sings this song and she does a really good job. She's going to be spending the summer at Circle Square Ranch again for the second year. And this year they've um, asked her to be part of the worship team there, so we're really excited about that. So we're going to give her a little bit of practice. <laughs> Yeah. Just that you guys are awesome. Every time I come here, I just enjoy spending worship time with you guys and just honoring to whom honor is due. It's so great to see you guys on fire, and it inspires me every time I come. I just want to say that you guys are awesome. <laughs> Love you guys.
got power in Jesus. And I want to talk a bit about that. I appreciate so much this church and the, your pastor is an awesome guy. We really feel a good kindred spirit with him and all of the folks that were here. And it was so good to see them up in Winnipeg the other day for the special services there. But we really love you folks and God is moving. But let's get into the word. I want to speak this morning on overcoming everything by a revelation of Jesus. All right. You know, you can overcome anything. Anything. If Jesus overcame death and we died with him and rose with him, there's no greater enemy than death. And he's already whipped. So what other enemy is there? And so let's get into this today. And I'm going to turn to Exodus chapter 3, verse 2. And then we're going into the book of Revelation in a minute. Exodus 3 and 2. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him, somebody say Moses, in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. You know, so many times God tries to get our attention, and we don't, he doesn't catch us. Right. He got Moses. And notice this, when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him. Until God can get your attention, he can't speak to you. But when the Lord sees that he's caught your attention, then he starts talking. Moses, Moses, and he said, here am I. And he said, draw not nigh hither, put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. Somebody say he was afraid. afraid. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt, and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. And I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians. Did you ever notice Moses tried on his own before? God says, now I'm coming down to do it. I'm coming down. To bring them up out of that land, unto a good land and a large, unto a land flowing with milk and honey, unto the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And when Moses had this holy ground experience, he was in the holiest of holies. How many know what the holiest of holies is in the temple? That's where the Ark of the Covenant was. Only one man a year could go in there back in the Old Testament. But you know what? We believers can all go in. But just because we can go in doesn't mean we are in there all the time. But we should be. And then in Joshua chapter 5, this man, Joshua, had a similar experience. Somebody say 40 years later. Verse 13, And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, there stood a man over against him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went unto him and, Josh, and said unto him, Art thou for us or for our adversaries? And he said, Nay, I'm not either. I'm not for you. I'm not for your adversaries. But he said, I'm captain. You're listening to me, boy. <laughs> I'm not for you as though I'm going to listen to you. You're going to listen to me. Nay, I'm captain of the host of the Lord, and I am now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship and said unto him, What saith my Lord unto his servant? Now Joshua was in the proper place calling him Lord. And the captain of the Lord's host said unto Joshua, Loose thy shoe from off thy foot, for the place whereon thou standest is holy. And Joshua did so. And Joshua was in the holiest of holies also. Did you notice God said the same thing to Moses that he did to Joshua? Take your shoes off your feet. You're on holy ground. Man, I feel the Holy Ghost just saying that. And one of them was Moses spoken to in regards to getting Israel out of Egypt. And Joshua in the second occurrence was in getting Israel out of the wilderness. And how many know he brings us out to bring us in? And let's worship and thank God right now for his word. Lord, we thank you, God. Thank you for your awesome presence in this house, for the worship, for this congregation and pastor. And Lord, all the ministries that are here that you're going to set on fire and ignite and explode and work in this world through the empowerment of your spirit and by the direction of your word. 
And in Jesus' name, let the anointing flow powerfully. And let every heart receive it just as you would have us receive it. In the name of Jesus Christ, say amen. amen. Let's clap again. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Amen, amen. And so these two encounters were both on holy ground, but they were quite different. You've obviously noticed that Moses didn't see what Joshua saw, but although they were both told to remove their shoes for the holy ground's sake. But Moses saw God appear in a burning bush, and Joshua saw an angel of the Lord with a sword drawn in his hand. And there's a reason they saw what they saw. And I believe God's going to open that up to us today because we're at either one of these two stages. We're past one of the two, but God wants us to go all the way. Amen. How many know God was taken to the promised land? I want to get into the promised land, and I'm not talking about heaven, though I believe there's a heaven. If I should die today, I'll be there. But what I'm talking about when I say promised land is a place in the kingdom of God where you're tearing down walls and you're killing giants. And that, is, that isn't in heaven. So somehow promised land get compared to heaven. I don't know how, but it's getting in the place with God right now. And so in Exodus 3 and 4, notice that when the Lord saw that Moses turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the bush, said, Moses, Moses, he said, here am I. But in Joshua 6 and 2, when God speaks to Joshua, says, See, I have given into thine hand Jericho and the king thereof and the mighty men of valor. And I want you to see something. When Moses saw, it said, the angel of the Lord was in the burning bush. God talked to him out of that bush. Now, when you think of angel of the Lord, you might think of Michael or Gabriel or somebody. But that's not the case. When it says angel of the Lord, it's usually God himself in a form. Right. Now, how many know you can't see God? So when God takes on a form, they call it his, the angel of the Lord. Right. That's the, some people call it a theophany. Yeah. And, and same thing when Joshua saw this man with a sword drawn in his hand. When you keep on reading into chapter 6 from chapter 5, it's God talking to him. I have given into your hand Jericho and the king and all the mighty men. Right. So it's God appearing to him. And both of these accounts were associated with the dividing of waters. Remember the Red Sea opened up with Moses and then the Jordan opened up with Joshua. And so there's a lot of similarities here. They weren't just both on holy ground, but they both saw waters opened up. And, and there's a remarkable parallel that God opened my eyes to with both of these accounts in the book of Revelation. And in Revelation... We see what corresponds to Moses' burning bush experience and Joshua's angel of the Lord with a sword experience. And this is where it gets awesome. Praise God. Go back to Exodus 3 and 2. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. Everybody say midst of a bush. And he looked and behold the bush burned with fire and the bush was not consumed. You see, there's a very important point there that Moses had tried to deliver Israel before on his own power, on his own steam, and he got burned out. But when God says, now I'm coming down and I'm going to do it and you're going to work with me, and it's kind of like the same thing the angel said to Joshua. No, I'm not for you. You're for me. I'm captain and you're going to follow me because, folks, if you don't learn to follow the Lord in your battles, you're going to burn out. But when God gives you a revelation that he's going to do it and you're going to help, you're going to work with him, then you're not going to burn out. And that bush that wouldn't burn out represented Moses if he'd only follow the Lord. Amen. How many have ever got burnt out trying to do something for God? That's because you're running on your own steam. But it's like Isaiah said, if you wait on the Lord, then you'll mount up with wings as eagles and you'll run and you won't faint. In other words, you won't get burned out. And there's so many people get burned out because they're, trying, they're, they're doing it sincerely. They want to do something for the Lord, but they've never really learned and they never thought about it that God is going to give you the strength and power and He's going to lead and He's going to give you the ideas. Don't come up with your own ideas yeah. for God's kingdom. Yeah. He gives you His ideas. Woo, somebody praise Him. Yeah. Hallelujah. 
And so that's why God appeared to him that way. When the Lord saw that he turned to see that that bush wasn't being burnt, God called unto him. Now look in Revelation 1. Just like Moses turned and saw God in a burning bush, John turns and sees Jesus in a burning tree-shaped candlestick. It says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. That's just like take off your shoes, you're on holy ground talk. Yeah. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a voice as of a trumpet saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what thou seest, write in a book and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardius, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. He turned around just like Moses did and then God started giving him a revelation. When you get in the Spirit, you're going to get a revelation. It's true, it's true. You're going to get a revelation. So many times we're not really in the Spirit and somebody's getting a revelation and we're not and we're wondering what are they getting so awesomely excited about and I'm not and that's because they get in the Spirit, you didn't. So that's why I appreciate when Pastor Tony tonight said, let's get our hearts tuned to the Spirit and give your ear and give your heart because like that vessel, when it's open, the anointing oil flows. You'll get filled with anointing if you open your heart. If you're just going to say, oh, we're going to see what this guy's like this morning. Well, you're not going to get anything out of it because you're closed. But if you just open up, not to me, but to him, because he's going to use me. But you know, God uses people. Remember when Moses... Somebody might think Moses was a bit arrogant when he said, if you're on the Lord's side, come to me. But he wasn't being arrogant at all because God uses people. And you've got to recognize that. If you're on the Lord's side, you've got to go to certain men of God. How many know you just can't go to any man of God if you want to be on the Lord's side? Because not every man of God gets in the Spirit either. But when somebody's in the Spirit and they've proven their ministry and God's using them and anointing them and there's a witness of the Holy Ghost, you go with them and you'll be on the Lord's side. Somebody say amen. amen. Well, me and Jesus got our own thing going. No, you don't. <laughs> you don't have your own thing going with Jesus. Jesus works in a body. He works with many members, many people. And by the way, did you notice that those seven candlesticks that Jesus appeared in the midst of when John saw him? How many remember what the candlesticks represented? The churches. And the first thing John saw when he heard that voice, he saw the candlesticks. And then after he saw the candlesticks, it says he saw Jesus. So if the candlesticks represent the church, when Jesus talks to you, it's going to be through his church. And you're going to see the church first. But you're going to find Jesus in the midst of the church. It's good. It's good. Now the reason I'm saying that is because some people think they don't need church. They just get something. No, you need church. That's set in the Word of God. And if you're going to serve God according to the Bible, you've got to have a church. Somebody say amen. amen. And you'll find more anointing. You'll find more power. You'll never be as anointed on your own as when you are with a body of people. Praise God. And so John saw the counterpart of, counterpart of Moses' vision when he saw Jesus in burning candlesticks shaped like a tree, just like Moses. You ever see the candlestick in the temple? Yeah. It's had six branches on this one side and then and, and the seventh in the middle. and yeah. It was tree-shaped, yeah. just like Moses saw a burning bush. And both times in the book of Revelation, when John sees something like similar to Moses, and then I'm going to go in another chapter and show you where he saw something similar to what Joshua saw, God's voice sounded like a trumpet in both times. Notice, I heard a voice behind me as a great trumpet. And then when you go to... Well, we'll keep reading here for a minute. And then it says in chapter 1, verse... Uh, let me see, where am I? Verse 12, I turned to see the voice that spake with me, being turned, there it is, I saw seven golden candlesticks. He sees the churches first. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like the Son of Man. And it says all these descriptions about him. Clothed with... Uh, and then in chapter 4, here's the second vision of Revelation. And it corresponds to what Joshua saw. In Revelation 4, after this I looked and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was as it were what? A trumpet. There's a voice talking like a trumpet again. And this time it's saying, come up hither and I will show thee. Somebody say, I will reveal. I will reveal. 
I'll give you revelation. I will show you things which must be hereafter. And immediately, there it is again. I was in the Spirit. Ooh, when you really hear the word of the Lord, boom, you're going to be in the Holy Ghost. You're going to be in the Spirit. You're going to start getting revelations. And behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And so the one where John saw Jesus in candlesticks corresponds to Moses seeing God in a burning bush. But when John was caught up to heaven in chapter 4 and he saw a throne, that corresponds to what Joshua saw. And you might say, okay, well, I get that about God in the burning bush and God, Jesus in the candlesticks. But what about that angel with a sword, John, and what John sees in chapter 4? How does that correspond with Joshua? Well, it's not so much the angel that shows the corresponding link. But when John saw Jesus, well, well, look at this first. Here it is. Revelation 4 flows into Revelation 5. Somebody say it's the same vision. Same vision. And he hears words saying, come on in and take the book. And it says, no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to look upon the book, neither to look thereon. To open the book, neither to look. And then verse 6 says, behold, I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne of the four beasts, watch it, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as it had been slain, having what? Seven horns and seven eyes. Now, keep in mind, everybody say seven horns. seven horns. And those seven horns on that lamb and those seven eyes, they're the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. And that lamb with these seven horns and seven eyes came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat on the throne. And watch in Joshua 6 and 2, when that angel was talking to Joshua, the angel with the sword, he gives them these instructions. The Lord said unto Joshua, See, I've given into your hand Jericho. I've given you the king. I've given you the mighty men of valor. And you're going to compass the city. All you men of war, go round about the city once. This is what you'll do for six days. And seven priests shall bear before the ark seven trumpets of ram's horns. Everybody say, seven horns, seven horns. are on Jesus. And Joshua is told, take seven ram's horns. Now, Jesus was a lamb in Revelation. And how many know lambs and rams are the same species? And here in Joshua, he's told, get seven horns from a ram and blow those horns when I tell you to blow it. And the walls of Jericho are going to come down. Hallelujah. How many know seven in the Bible means all? It means complete. Seven days in a week is a whole week. God finished. Everybody say finished. Finished. His work and rest of the seventh day. Seven means you're finished. It's complete. It's all. And then if all is seven and horns mean power, then all power is in Jesus Christ. He's got seven horns. And folks, when you think of Jesus and all his power and think of Joshua marching around Jericho and having those priests blow those horns, all the power of God smashed Jericho in the promised land. How would you like to have the power of God in your life when any enemies come against you? All the power. That's why all things are under our feet with Jesus Christ. We can overcome everything because Jesus is the one with all power, seven horns. And I died with him, I was buried with him, and I'm risen and seated with that Jesus on his throne above all powers. Somebody say, all power is on our side. But how many know there's Christians that struggle? And they're not enjoying victory. But the Bible says all power. In fact, Jesus said it after he resurrected in Matthew 28. Yeah. All power in heaven and earth is given unto me. Yeah. And you go, therefore, and baptize. Yeah. Why? Because all power is in me. Baptize them into my name. Yeah. Because all power is in me. How many like to get that name on your life? Yeah. But you can get that name, you can have that power, and not know how to handle it, not know how to use it. And that's why we get discouraged. So I'm here to help you this morning. I'm going to show you how to use that power. And if you've ever been discouraged, ever been defeated, I'm going to tell you how you can stop experiencing that. How many want to learn how? Thank you, Lord. So he went through that Jordan River with those seven priests, 
Amen. Then marched around the Jericho with the trumpets blowing and brought down that city. And you know what's so wonderful about this is Joshua is the Hebrew form of the name Jesus. Joshua is the same name of Jesus in the Old Testament. Everybody hear the Hebrew word Yeshua? That's, that's Joshua or Jesus in Hebrew. And so Jesus is seen with seven horns going to that throne and taking that book. Just like Joshua was going to lead Israel through the Jordan and take that promised land and conquer every kingdom there and make it a land of milk and honey for themselves. Wow. Praise God. Now, like Joshua battles all of these tribes in Canaan, and finally, he finds rest. If you go to the end of the book of Joshua, how many ever read where Joshua conquered all his enemies and they had rest all round about? Joshua was an old man by then, conquered all these enemies, and he entered into a rest. When you read the book of Revelation, all this wrath is poured out on the enemies of God, and there's a new Jerusalem of rest and peace. You know Jerusalem means city of peace? And don't look at the earthly Jerusalem because that earthly Jerusalem is the most war-torn, ripped-up city I think there is on the planet Earth. That's not what God's talking about. It's a new Jerusalem. It's a new city of peace. And bless God, that's what you find at the end of the book of Revelation, just like the end of the Exodus journey. They find rest and they conquer all their enemies. And bless God, God's people are, are, are in a state of victory and conquest. But I'm going to bring this down to you as an individual. You need to come to this place of rest and victory. Like I said, you need to learn how to use the power of God. Yeah. And just like God's goal for Israel, I'm going to free you from Egypt. I'm going to bring you in that promised land, drive out the enemy, and I'm going to give you a city called Jerusalem. God wants to save us out of sin, bring us to a place of kingdom power, and bring us into a spiritual new Jerusalem here and now in this present world. How many know you can have victory in the midst of a storm? You ever hear that song, Peace in the Midst of a Storm? You know, even if the storm doesn't stop, you still have peace. Kind of reminds me of Jesus sleeping in the boat while the storm was going on. And if they weren't so scared, he would have kept on sleeping. Sometimes you don't need the storm to stop. You just need to rest anyway. Because God's going to be with you whether there's a storm or not. And the only reason he stopped the storm was because they were so afraid. He said, oh ye of little faith, peace be still. And the storm stopped. But if they hadn't have gotten him up, he would have left there, been left there sleeping. And I want to rest with him through every storm. That's victory. Hallelujah. Oh, God, God, stop this storm. Stop this storm. He doesn't need to stop every storm you go through. Yeah, right. Sometimes he just wants you to learn to have peace when you go through it. Yeah. And just say, uh, I, one woman, she, in the 1600s, God was using her so remarkably that she didn't even realize that the gifts of the Spirit she was operating were listed in 1 Corinthians 12. And, and she was getting word of knowledge, and God was sure about people, and she wondered how all these things came to me. And, I was, and one night she was laying in her bed, and all of a sudden her bed got banging on the floor. Literally, the legs were lifting up and banging on the floor. And there's a spirit in the room. She sat up calmly. Devil, you can do all you want. I'm with the Lord and you don't scare me a bit. And laid back down. Yeah. Why didn't she cast the thing out of there? Well, maybe she wanted to torment it a little. Hallelujah, yeah. the presence of God in her room. Yeah. Praise God, we got peace in Jesus Christ. In fact, sometimes we should say, no, devil, you're not getting out of here because I'm going to drive you batty now. You shouldn't have come around me and just go after him in the name of Jesus, torment him of how the blood destroyed him and how the biggest mistake he ever made was crucifying my Lord on the cross and make him suffer for a little while. Now get out of here. <laughs> Praise God. Ooh, somebody say power. power. But in Revelation, John experiences something in chapter 1 that God had to deal with. And this is really going to bring it down to where we live. John was set free in Revelation 1 from something when he saw that vision of Jesus. Does anybody know what God, Jesus set John free from in Revelation 1? Did you ever notice it? Somebody say God's into details. God's into details. Slow down and look at some of these statements in Revelation. I'm going to show you here in a minute. But... In chapter 
6 of Revelation, Jesus with the seven horns breaks open some seals and the enemy is attacked and destroyed and defeated by God. And then finally you come to a city. So these two visions are very important. Just like Moses, Israel was only coming out of Egypt when Moses saw that vision. But Israel was going far advanced from just coming out of Egypt when Joshua saw his vision because they were coming out of the wilderness. You see, so many people and Christians are out of sin, but they're not out of the wilderness yet. They're, they're fussing with themselves. How many know Israel fussed with each other when they were in the wilderness? There you had... Uh, Dathan, Abiram, and Korah arguing with Moses is who do you think you are? And you get people today arguing with the pastor, who do you think you are? You know, it's like we fight amongst ourselves when we're in the wilderness. And one Christian, I ain't going to church because so and so said something about me and I heard about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Grow up! Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> get out of the wilderness! Yes. For goodness sake, there's enemies to fight in the promised land. And if you're fighting one another in the wilderness, God can't use you against the enemy. And the enemy loves that because if he can get you stirred up with each other, then he's got it scot-free. You're not going to harm him at all. But really give him a black eye and say, I forgive my brother, I forgive my sister, but I ain't forgiving you, devil, and I'm going after you in the promised land. God says, oh, you're ready to graduate. Come out of that wilderness and start helping me fight enemies. Woo, the real enemy. We don't fight flesh and blood. It's principalities, demons, and powers that we fight. But so many Christians fight each other. They get so upset by another Christian and so torn down that they, they get all distracted and quit church and go somewhere else. And God's just shaking his head. Is there somebody that will grow up around here that I can help use to, to destroy the enemy, the real enemy? And so Moses represents when we first get saved and we go through this childish wilderness experience. Because you're a baby when you're born again, right? Yes. You're going to be immature. Yeah. God knows that. He expects that. But it gets kind of sickening when you have to part the mustache to put the bottle in the person's mouth. <laughs> there comes a time when you grow up and get off the bottle. <laughs> I mean, you've got to feed a baby a bottle, but when you've got to part the mustache to do it, come on now, there's something wrong. And, and, and so Joshua represents the place where you come where now you're going to fight devils. You're seeing an angel of the Lord with a sword. You're not just seeing a burning bush because God's got to teach you, okay, stop getting so burnt out all the time. But then by the time you graduate to the next revelation, he says, now you see the sword? You're going to fight. And there's going to be seven trumpets of ram's horns that's going to tear down. All the power of Jesus is what you're going to use to fight the enemy. But until you can graduate... And, and learn, stop getting burned out by people. Yeah. Yeah. See, Moses was burnt out by people. And he was trying in his own power, and they were fussing with him. Remember when he came and they said, who do you think you are? I mean, they, he had that problem for 40 years. Yeah. I think he was glad for the Lord to take him. <laughs> <laughs> and then Joshua took over, and he sees a warrior angel. Now we're going to get into warfare. See, God can't use us in spiritual warfare when we're immaturely fussing with little earthly things. Good, right. Good preaching. And so God wants to use us so much. But the devil, the Bible says in Timothy that the devil can take some people captive at his will. I mean, he knows exactly how to push their button and get them upset. Okay, they're gone. They're weak. Little runts, they'll never be back. Don't worry about them. But if somebody gets a hold of God, I'm not going to let my brother offend me anymore. I'm not going to let my... I don't know why I'm on this, but somebody needs to hear what I'm saying right now. I know I'm speaking to somebody. You need to get victory over people. So God can use you against the devil. Somebody needs to hear this. You need to get victory over people. Forget about them. Don't worry about what they say. Don't worry about what they do. In fact, God will keep letting them bug you until you get over it. So if it's bothering you enough... Pass the test now so you don't have to go through it anymore. Yeah. 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 Woo. Somebody need to, I know when I'm talking to somebody. I don't know who it is sometimes. Somebody say, thank God. <laughs> but anyhow, John was set free from something in chapter 1, but then, praise God, the enemy was broken and defeated after the second vision. And so we need a real revelation of Jesus where we see something about him that affects us. And it affects us so much we get victory over some things, and then we can go on to another revelation, and now he's going to give us victory over the enemy. And so Moses sees God in a burning bush, but Joshua saw a more advanced revelation going across Jordan and taking the land. 
And only people on holy ground will get these revelations. Only people that get in the Spirit. How many really want to get victory and get in the Spirit? Hallelujah. Somebody say freedom from Egypt. Freedom from Egypt. And then freedom from the wilderness. Freedom from the wilderness. And so, watch this. When John saw Jesus in Revelation 1, it says, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. Now, let's find out the fault that John had here that God had to deal with. He laid his right hand upon me, and saying unto me, and here's what John's problem was. Fear. Everybody say fear. fear. Jesus saw him in fear. And he had to deal, he had to deliver him from that. He said, fear not. I am the first and the last, John. I'm alive. I, I, I am he that liveth was dead. Behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of death and hell. Why are you afraid? See, God's got to deliver us from fear. He fell like a dead man. Everybody say he fell like a dead man. Notice that? I fell at his feet as dead. And then in Exodus 3 and 6, Moses is here Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid. afraid. He became afraid, too. There's, you see so many parallels between Exodus and, and Revelation. And God has to get rid of this fear. Moses was so fearful, he said, I'm not talking to that Pharaoh. I'm a man slow of speech. And then I can't do this, and I can't do that, and God can't use me. God's got to get this fear out of us, because through Christ I can do anything. Because the reason, oh, praise God, God's showing. The reason Moses was afraid, because he was looking at his own abilities. But you have to stop looking at your own abilities. Just like he tried to deliver Israel on his own, and God said, I'm going to use you. What's wrong with you, boy? And then finally, we think we're going to do everything, and so we become afraid. But it's not you, it's him, and his power is going to be on you. And that's why in the next vision, John sees seven horns on the lamb, which represents all the power of Jesus. You're not going in your own power. You're going in all his power. Amen. And so if you know it's not your power, you're not going to be afraid anymore. If it was up to me and my power, I'd run like a chicken. But bless God, it's his power that's on me, and he's going to deliver them through me. Then I know I'm going in his power. So I don't have to be afraid. Woo! I want to kick fear in the teeth this morning and let you know, amen, all things are naked and open unto him. All power in heaven and earth is given unto him. And you go in the might of his power. Yeah. Or go in the power of his yeah. might, Ephesians chapter 6 says. We always go after the enemy in our own power. And we get whipped, we get burnt out and scared. And we get so scared, I ain't doing that again. You go forth in the power of his might. And you won't burn out. And the enemy will run like a wet pup. Yeah. How many know dogs can sense fear? Yeah. The devil can sense fear. Yeah. But when he come against the daughter and the son of God that knows that all power of Jesus is on them, yeah. amen, and they know they're not on their own, they know he's going to yes. use us, then bless God, the devil's going to run. That's the same thing that is. See, that older generation, man, they had that problem. The giants and the well walls, we can't go in there, Moses. And Joshua was ready to be tied. We are able. God is with us. He kept saying, God, we forget God's with us half the time. But if you just stop and think of it, he said, I'll never. Somebody say never. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. And so whenever you get in a terrifying situation, bless God, he said he'd never forsake you. He's there right now. You got nothing to be afraid of. Turn your lights off at night. You got nothing to be afraid of. Jesus is with you. That's right. And he will never leave you. Are you going to believe his word or aren't you? Yeah, right. Oh, we need to hear the word. We need to believe that and remember it. Everybody can hear it, but remember it. <laughs> yeah. Woo. And so Moses and John were struck with fear. And a similar answer was given to both of them. Remember, he said, I am. You see, Jesus said, I am he that liveth and was dead. He didn't say, I am dead. I was dead. How many know there's a difference between am and was? Yeah. He said, I was dead, but I am alive forevermore. And how did John fall? He fell like a what? Dead man. And then Jesus said, I was dead, but I'm alive. Stop fearing. Did you catch it? He said, I was dead, John. You fall like a dead man in fear? I was dead and I'm alive forevermore. What's wrong with you? Yeah. 
In other words, you're connected to me, man. You died with me and you get victory over me. Why are you laying there like a dead man? We're alive from the dead. Hallelujah. You know what we need to do? We need to get out of the tomb and walk in resurrection life. And what I mean by that is we're laying like dead people too much. And Jesus has given us resurrection life and we ain't, we're not walking in it. Oh, I'm afraid of this and I'm afraid of that. Come out of the tomb. Roll that stone away and walk in newness of life. That's victory. But we're between the death and the resurrection. We're stuck in the tomb. We're, we're between Egypt and Canaan. We're in the wilderness. We got to come out and walk. Hallelujah. And then look at this in chapter 3, verse 6. I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Then in verse 8, I'm come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians. I'm going to bring them to a good land and so forth and so on. And he says, I am. Somebody say, God is the I am. He's the I am. He says, I am, I am, I am. And then in Revelation 1, 17, when I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man. This is slowing down on me. And he laid his right hand upon me. Catch up. I command you to catch up. <laughs> Just a second. It's going to pop up there in a minute. Tell him to say amen when it pops up. Amen. Fear not. I said when it pops up. <laughs> Fear not, I am the first and the last. <laughs> you could get me looking back all the time. Turned around to see the Lord, and there he was in the burning bush. I am he that liveth and was dead. Behold, I am alive forevermore. Jesus said, I am alive forevermore. Only one guy ever said, I am that I am. Remember Jesus said before Abraham was? I am. I am. Yeah. Hallelujah. And so the title used by Jesus was the title God used for himself. And folks... Jesus said, I was dead and I'm alive, John, because Jesus was trying to get John to apply what was true of Jesus to himself. Mm -hmm. yes. Here is how you get victory. You start applying what's true of Jesus to yourself. Because when you get saved, you die with Jesus. Mm -hmm. His death is yours. Mm -hmm. When you get saved, you're buried with him. His burial becomes yours. When he was resurrected and sat on the throne, you were resurrected with him and you sat on the throne with him. And bless God, if you got all those things that's true of Jesus going for you, then when he says, I was dead and I'm alive forevermore, this is a revelation of Jesus. Why do you think God's giving John a revelation of Jesus? Because when you see Jesus, you see everything that's true about you. You realize, wait a minute, I died with you. And I was buried with you and I'm risen with you. What am I doing laying here like a dead man? I should be alive. Because what's ever true of you, Jesus, is true of me. Because I'm in Christ. How many are in Christ? Did you get baptized into Jesus Christ? If you get baptized into him, then everything true about him is true of you. You get, you get enveloped in him. You, you get wrapped up and submerged and baptized in him. And everything that's true of him is true of you. That's why you're Jesus' name. That's why when you go after the devil, you say, in the name of Jesus, I go after you. Because you know everything true about Jesus is on you. And you know the devil isn't afraid of you, but he's afraid of Jesus. And when you go in the name of Jesus, he says, oh boy, here we go all over again with the cross. And you crucify him and tear the devil up all over again. Somebody say, thank you, Lord. Thank you. Hallelujah, God. That screen just doesn't want to come up. So, you need to get over your fear. Amen. In Revelation 1, 17, when I saw him, I rebuked this thing right now. <laughs> I must have put an animation on there. I didn't know I put it on there. There. Look at this in Romans 6 and 10. For in that he died, he died unto sin how many times? Once. Once. In that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise reckon yourselves also to be dead indeed unto sin. Take his death that he died once and reckon it to yourself that you died 
indeed under sin. And just like he lives under God, you apply that to you, you're alive unto God. How? It's through Jesus Christ that you're alive. And so that's why you say, in the name of Jesus, through Jesus, I've got power over you. And if the devil says, how do you know that? Because I got baptized into him. And when I got baptized into him, I took on his death. I took on his burial. And I took on his resurrection. And I'm going to take you on now. Woo! We've got power. At least write amen on paper if you agree with it. Yeah. <laughs> this guy was preaching down at ACE and he says, if you ain't going to shout, at least write it on paper and say amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. To save John out of fear and to go on to the rest of the revelations God wanted to show John, he had to apply his own resurrection to John and get John to see that. And just like Israel, they had to realize they had God with them so they could take on Canaan and take out enemies. Praise God. How many want to get a real revelation of who you are in Christ so you can take on enemies where you're so full of faith that anytime the enemy comes up, that's nothing to you because you're with Jesus and Jesus is above all and you're with him. So what's this? I'll tell you, that's how you start thinking when you really get this into your blood. You start thinking, what? That's why John and or rather Paul in Romans chapter 8 says, who, who is he that condemns us? Yeah. Who do they think they are? Yeah. You know, I was dead with Christ. I was risen up. God gave his only son for me. I mean, who does anybody think they are? Who is he that condemneth? Who is he that casts us down? Who do they think they are? I'm one with Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. And you think about that when it comes to the devil and you rip him up every time he goes after you. It's just like a, a kid that knows their parent doesn't mean it when they say, be good. <laughs> and they'll keep on doing it. Yeah. He doesn't mean it. But when a kid knows his dad means it, oh, be good. He bees good. <laughs> <laughs> now, look at this in Exodus 3 and 7. And the Lord said, I've surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt. I heard the cry, Moses, by reason of their taskmasters. And I am come down. Somebody say, I am come down. I'm going to do it. I'm going to deliver this time. I'm going to take them from bondage. Somebody say he took Israel out of bondage. God took John out of bondage. Did anybody read these scriptures in Hebrews 2 and 14? Just like the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he himself likewise took part of the same. Why? Why did he take on flesh and blood like us? That through death. You see, God can't die. But if he takes on flesh and blood, he can die. And so through death, by, because he had flesh and blood, he could destroy him that had the power of death. That is the devil. And deliver them who through fear, fear, fear of death, we're all their lifetime subject to bondage. And God shows the same thing to John. You're in bondage. You get the fear of death on you. I'm going to set you free and let you realize you're risen with me. And if you're risen over death, there's no greater enemy you could be risen over. So who cares about financial problems? Who cares about sickness and cancer and leukemia? Death is the worst of them all. And Jesus took him out and you died with Jesus. And because of that, you can come against anything else. Somebody say, if death was the greatest enemy, then any other enemies are runt. Any other enemies are runt. And you already got victory over death. How many are getting what I'm saying? You getting this? Hallelujah. And then it says in Romans 8 and 14, for as many as are led by the Spirit, they are the sons of God. You haven't received the spirit of bondage again to fear. You haven't received fear. What are you fearful for? You've received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Yeah. And Jesus died and resurrected so that he could deliver us from that bondage of fear and death, and we could be set free and get ready to tear down the enemy. Now, watch this. In Revelation 12. Let me just say something quick. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to be too much longer. I know time's getting on. But watch this. When Moses was taken out of Egypt with Israel and they were at the Red Sea. Let me just go ahead here a bit. It, the Lord said, I can't find it here right now, but the Lord said, stand still. Everybody say, stand still, stand still. and see the glory of the Lord. 
the Lord will fight your battle. When Israel came out of Egypt, the Lord was going to fight their battle. They couldn't fight. God didn't expect them to. But when they came to Joshua's vision, and all the doubters were gone, the older generation that couldn't believe they could defeat giants in well-walled cities, they died. God says, now I get rid of that unbelief. God needs to get those elder folks out of your hearts too. All those doubts you have, he needs to get that out or you're not going in the promised land. And when Joshua saw that angel, the angel said, now you are going to fight with me. I did all the fighting when I brought you out of Egypt. But now that you're grown, now that you're mature, now that you're finally in that place where I can use you, you're going to fight with me. How many would like to join in side by side with Jesus? Take out the sword of the word and start slashing devils and start tearing down the enemies. You're too young. I can't make you fight with me. you got to stand still and I'm going to fight your battles but when you go up in the Holy Ghost and you get over people and you get over fear then you're ready to roll up your sleeves and fight devils and now swing your arms Joshua you are mighty men of war now all of you and when they came out of Egypt it says a mixed multitude came out of Egypt and there was people that weren't even serving God that just wanted to get away from Pharaoh and they came with Israel and they were the ones that gave them a lot of trouble but when they got time to go into the promised land, those guys were gone. Mm -hmm. And if any of them had come in like that, they were now turned around and really serving God. Mm -hmm. And praise God, they were going to go into that land. Well, actually, none of them were there. Only Joshua and Caleb were the only ones that survived the older generation. Remember that? Mm -hmm. And so God says, now you're going to fight with me. We're going to tear down the parasites. Uh, all the tribes, all the ites that you read about, all the, 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 and praise God, folks, God wants us to tear down enemies. And after you read about this, after you read about the vision that John had in chapter 4 and 5, the wrath of God comes down, and then it says something awesome in chapter 12, verse 11. They, the people of God, overcame the devil. How would you like to overcome the devil now? God had to overcome him for you, but when you grow up spiritually, you you're going to overcome them now. And you come to a place where you can overcome anything. All because of a revelation of Jesus. Amen. How many want to see that second revelation? Yeah. Do you want to see that second vision? Do you want to... I saw the burning bush, and I saw God in there, and, and I saw him say, I'm going to fight your battles for you, son. It's going to be all right. And he got a lot of fear out of me. But praise God, I'm seeing him now with a sword in his hand, and he's looking me in the eye, and he said, you're going to fight with me. You take seven horns. In other words, church, you take all the power of Jesus now and use it. How many want to use that power now? Oh. I don't even know if this is in my notes or not, but this is coming to my heart right now. They took the blood of the lamb, they put it around the doorways, and then that overcame death. And they took a certain kind of branch. Does anybody remember what kind of branch that was? Hyssop. Hyssop. And if you go in the book of Kings, I can't find the verse right now, but um, it says, from the mighty oak to the hyssop, which grows out of a wall. The oak is like the biggest tree. The hyssop is the tiniest. And he says, that little tiny thing, you can apply the blood around your door. Your door is your mouth. And you take just a little bit of faith, like a hyssop, like a seed of mustard, mustard seed, and apply the power of the blood to your mouth and speak it out and say, I know what the blood has done for me. You're going to speak down devils. You're going to speak down walls and giants. You're going to speak down sickness. I've cast demons of cancer out of people and they were absolutely clear of the spirit. Cancer, not a trace of it left. Because I spoke in the name of Jesus Christ. And you need to apply it to your yes. mouth, the door of your house, and let it out. Yes, yes, yes. Hallelujah. Yes. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and what? The what of their testimony? The word. you got to speak it. Let the redeemed of the Lord say it. Say it. I'm redeemed. Say I'm redeemed. I'm redeemed. Say the blood of Jesus, blood of Jesus. gives me power. Over sickness. over sickness. Say the blood, the blood gives power, gives power over, Satan. over Satan. You're saying it. Do you hear yourself say Say the blood, the blood gives power, power over, sin. over sin. 
Say the blood gives power over the flesh, over the world, over everything that comes against me. Stand to your feet right now and say, I am redeemed. And in Revelation chapter 5, amen, somebody could come to the music. When they worship that lamb for taking the book, when the second vision was given to John, he, they said, you have redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and people and tongue and nation, the four corners of the earth. And you have made us kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. When you get that second revelation, when God has set you free from fear with the first one, and he's set you free from bondage of the fear of death from the first one. And you get victory over people. You get victory over yourself, the world. Then you're ready to go after demons. Have you ever seen a demon cast out of somebody before? I was with you, Brother Tony, when Brother Suber prophesied deliverance. I was watching it on the internet. Deliverance is being raised up in Canada. And we were here one day cast a demon out of somebody, that thing roared and screamed and sat on guy was sitting on a chair and dragged that chair way over here and those devils came out by the power of the name of Jesus. And you know what? These signs shall follow them that believe. And the very first one he says is you shall cast out devils. The very first one! And you hardly ever see it anymore. I think churches are being built in the wilderness too much. We need to build churches in the promised land where we've got power. Woo, where we get power and we know it hallelujah and then we finally get rest from all our enemies kick back, put up our shoes and take her easy Woo, and enter into that place of Jesus Christ somebody say from Egypt to Jerusalem 